Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's speaker series talk. I think I know most of you at this point, but just in case, my name is Sarah Holland Levin. I am a second year PhD student in the communication department here at UConn, and I'm also the um, secretary for the Communication Graduate Student Association. So today we're going to be hearing from Dr. Stefano. He is our fellow communication faculty member and also the director of undergraduate studies for the communication department as well. Um, so he's going to be speaking to us today about multimedia stimulus design, something that I think is especially relevant to all of us. I know it's super important to each of us that we incorporate realistic and high quality stimulus design in our work. Um, and so I'm super excited for this presentation and I think that it should lead to some meaningful discussion afterwards. Uh, so without further ado, I am happy to introduce Dr. Steve Stefano. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, and thanks to all of you who are out there watching this stream. Uh, I do wish we were able to do this in a big room in person uh, so we could kind of have the live call and response, if you will, of looking at some of these stimuli together. But given the circumstances, I think we try to do the best we can. And for a presentation on multimedia, it's hard to do better than a live stream. So here we go. I'm also looking on the bright side and thinking perhaps we'll have a record of this talk and maybe we can find some use for it in the department later on. Uh, so. As Sarah mentioned in her gracious introduction, my name is Steve Stefano, uh, and I've been doing work across a number of fields, chief among them communication, of course. But ever since I was a teenager, I've been doing work in multimedia design, whether it was graphic design, video work, uh, layout, print, et cetera, you name it. And so today, the purpose of my talk is to discuss the fusion of that work I've been doing since I was a kid with the work that we all do now as researchers uh, in a social science program in communication. And one of the biggest overlaps we have there has to do with multimedia used as part of our experiments. And so that's our conversation today. And I hope this will be a useful, instructive tool for you to think about some things as you go forward in your presentations and your work uh, here forth. So multimedia stimulus design, how do we start? Well, I want you to think about this. So, Sometimes you see a headline like this or a takeaway from a paper or somebody presents a PowerPoint to you at a conference and they say something like, well, what we found were that individuals were more likely to believe a misleading Facebook post about a political candidate than a misleading news article. Okay, uh, and I wanna know if the Facebook post was written the same way, if it was a screenshot of a post that was actually made or if it's something that was placed together or if the text from the quote unquote Facebook post was just pasted to those respondents in some kind of a web survey format. I also want to know if the misleading news article was the same length as the Facebook post because I want to know if the same amount of burden was placed on the participants in that study. And these, and also did that news article look like a news article or was it something we slapped together in Microsoft Word and hoped for the best? Or you see a headline like this. Participants evaluated a social activism commercial featuring a female spokesperson as less credible than a commercial featuring a male spokesperson. Mm, yeah, and that would be instructive if that were 100% true, and it's kind of a disturbing finding. But before we start getting into the ramifications, because oftentimes if you see that kind of data presented at a conference, we will leap right from that statement, we'll throw a stat at you really quickly, we'll have glossed over most of the design, and then we'll start talking about the ramifications of this. Well, my first step is to say not so fast. Were the commercials identical? Were the spokespeople equally qualified to be spokespeople on camera? Were they both equally comfortable as they delivered the information? Or did you happen to grab two very different social activism ads and just throw them into a design to compare them against one another and then blame all the variants on the sex of the participant actually delivering the information in the commercial? Those are the questions that I, as a designer, have. Here's one. Individuals who watched a drama that included elements of choice reporting lower levels of enjoyment than individuals who watched a drama without choice points. Uh, I always find this choose your own adventure type of media stuff really interesting. It's more interactive. And we could talk all about whether or not people like it or don't like it, but I'm gonna ask you to back up again. How were the choices implemented? Were they distracting to the narrative? Was it clunky? Was the interface smooth? Was it easy to make the choice and stay immersed in the narrative? Or was it something that actually broke the entire flow of watching it and could have even broken the suspension of disbelief with the narrative itself? In other words, how did you implement that? Those are the kinds of questions that I like to ask when I think about stimulus design. Experiments are awesome. Experiments are really useful and they're a really fun way to gather information, particularly about important media topics. But 
we have to get the design right. And part of the design is the stimulus. And too often, we don't focus on that completely. So when we talk about multimedia stimulus design, just as a refresher to your introductory methods course, I'm talking about something where maybe we're comparing two groups of people, one of which has a manipulation that they see. So they see some piece of media that's different than the other group, or the media itself is shown in both conditions, but in one it's manipulated to some degree. And then we wanna see if the post test for that manipulation comes out different. Sometimes it's you know three different manipulations where we change a number of different, change some, the same thing in a number of different ways, and then we look at the post tests to see if there's something different. Sometimes we get really into it and we're changing maybe three different variables two different ways. So did we show them A or B? And then did we show them one or two? Or then did we show them X or Y? And we end up with these eight different conditions and we compare and contrast and do a bunch of advanced stats to figure out exactly what it is, had important effects, and maybe how those different conditions interacted with one another. All that, just a refresher, is a shorthand way of saying this. What I tell my introductory method students when I teach experimental design. We messed with this and it caused that to change. At least that's what we would like to simplify it down to. And I think that casual language is really helpful if you're first thinking about experiments. We messed with this thing and it caused this other thing to change. Now we can phrase it like this. We manipulated the independent variable and it caused the dependent variable to change. And I think, of course, that that is critical, but there's a bigger issue here, and that's that there's a disconnect in how we look at these things, okay? We spend a great deal of time thinking about the latter part of that equation. We spend an exceptional amount of time thinking about the dependent variable and what that is going to be when we actually practically employ it in the study. We worry about our operationalizations, we worry about the ways in which we're going to measure variables, which scales we use, whether or not we're going to look at behavior or we're going to look at actual impressions, perceptions through some kind of instrument, etc. We spend a lot of time on that. When we design dissertations, we spend a lot of time on that. When we simply look at and critique other people's research studies, we spend a lot of time on this. But how did you measure that thing you really care about? Because that probably has a huge influence on your results, right? We spend plenty of time on that. We're really good at that. The part we shy away from is the first part. How did the independent variable, that high flying idea you had, turn into this, the stimulus that you actually used? And for some of us, this might be a limitation on ability, it might be a limitation on comfort working in this realm, or it just might be an unfamiliarity with how much little things can change how audiences respond to media. I'm a filmmaker. I've shown films to rooms full of people. It's a fascinating and terrifying experience. I teach courses in multimedia production. Many of you know that the biggest thing we do is get our students in a big room downtown and show their films. And they say it is the most exhilarating and terrifying experience of their lives. And then you start to realize with the presence of an audience with you, when you take all this time on work, which things you did and which things you thought were important really had a concrete influence and which other things maybe fell flat and didn't really work. If you haven't had that experience, it's really easy to gloss over the relationship between the broad picture independent variable, the thing you think you're manipulating, and the byproduct end product that you're actually manipulating in that stimulus. Now, how did I start thinking about this? When I was a second year graduate student, I was approached by a senior grad student and a recent graduate to work on a project. The project was based on accents and how accents impact credibility, particularly when marketing products. The stimulus that they needed help creating was a commercial for something they argued most people really care for, I guess, except the lactose intolerant, ice cream. And so they created a brand, Guilty Pleasures Ice Cream. And the brand was supposed to be the finest, most discerning ice cream you can possibly buy, aimed at a sort of high level target audience. And so what they did with the commercial was they wrote out a script and they talked about all these fine things. And, and then they asked me, can you shoot something like this? Can you put this together? And it was quite the challenge for me. I was, I was about 23 years old and I was working with more senior researchers, more experienced graduate students. And I said, sure. And then I realized I'm going to have to buy all these different types of ice cream, film them different ways, get the right glass, get the right spoon to make it look the right way. And then they talked all about the ingredients and the, the special Madagascar vanilla that the, that the brand used and I didn't have Madagascar vanilla, so there I was in the produce section buying the ugliest green beans you've ever seen and then taking them home and painting them with a Sharpie 
as best I could just to sell it on camera for a second or two while it was on screen. And I spent all this time to try to get this right. And it still wasn't my finest work by any means, but I thought it was a pretty good looking ice cream commercial, especially for the time. We're talking about 2007 here. So it wasn't in super high definition and it wasn't beautiful and perfect and we didn't have the tools we have, but it passed as a commercial to me. And what they told me was that now they were gonna bring in voice actors from the School of Fine Arts who were not necessarily voice actors in the traditional Hollywood sense, but folks who understood the nuances of various accents, various English accents from folks from different parts of the world. And so they were going to deliver the copy of the advertisement, each person in those different accents. And they did. And then they asked me to marry it up to this commercial that we had made. And I did. And what I saw very quickly was an uh-oh in the making. And this was my first experience with stimulus design that made me have this moment. I said, what's going on here? And the reason I said, what's going on here is because the content that I was hearing didn't match the content I was seeing because these were folks who were experts at emulating specific English accents, specific accents from folks from various parts of the world speaking English but they were not folks who had an expertise in how to deliver a voiceover for an ice cream commercial. So what happened? We had these stilted, very accurate to certain regions of the world and how they speak English with an accent pieces that, look, that sounded nothing like an ice cream commercial. And the byproduct was I said, how would you ever motivate people to sell this product when no marketer, when, when no one would run this ad with that kind of voiceover because it didn't sound right? And then I had a weird thought. Maybe we'd be better with me <laughs> delivering the commercial copy and trying to emulate the accents. I didn't suggest that, <laughs> but I thought to myself that might be actually more useful. The idea here is we often have big dreams when we start our stimuli, but the actual product that we get seems to fade. I wanna fix the horse meme for you, okay? The back of the horse is beautiful, the study idea and then it starts to degrade a little bit because we start to get rushed. So we think, well, what can we accomplish with a stimulus idea? What won't stress us out too much? What won't take too much time? What gets us to the part where we actually collect data and can analyze it and write it up? And in reality, the actual stimulus that comes out in front of audiences a lot of times is not remotely as exciting, as optimistic, as far reaching as the study idea and the front end you might have already written claims that it will be. That's something we wanna fix, and that's something you can fix in your work. So let's talk about it methodologically for a minute, and then we'll talk about some examples. First, from an internal validity perspective, these are the things I start to think about, okay? First, how do we control confounds across conditions? I made some reference to that with those example sort of research headlines that we talked about before. One of, one of the ways we can do that is to make sure that everything, or as much as possible, is exactly the same in the different conditions that we show, except for this one central manipulation that we want. With media production, we often have a great amount of control. So we need to use that control. We need to harness it so that across conditions, we're getting solid stuff. Next thing, how do we keep respondents' attention? A lot of times what I see and what is really frustrating to me is that people who are actually responding to information are getting overwhelmed, they're bored. The average survey taker is very distracted. They have a short attention span. And even if we've locked them in a lab and effectively said, you're gonna sit here and watch this video, or you're gonna sit here and listen to this audio piece or read this news story, it doesn't mean that their mind, that their internal monologue won't eventually drift off and go, man, I'm bored. So how do we make sure we're keeping respondent attention? Something that's central to me. And then third, instrumentation. Are we priming people with the pretests that we give them? So for example, if you're gonna measure someone's response to a scene in Titanic and you wanna know whether or not they're the type person who's not only watched Titanic before but is really interested in that kind of material, you might ask them that in the pretest and now you've primed them to thinking about the movie Titanic before you show them that clip. So one of the ways I tend to deal with that, just as a simple example, is if I'm gonna ask about your prior media habits before you get in there and see my stimulus, I bury that Titanic question in with 15 or 20 other questions across a variety of different types of media content so that you're not going, oh, I guess this is about Titanic as you walk into the actual manipulation. External validity, this is where we really shine. 
Is it of high quality? What you're making or showing or demonstrating, is it high quality stuff or does it make the respondents go, what? What is this? What am I looking at? Or what am I reading? Or what am I listening to? Second, is it realistic? And that ties in as well. A lot of times we don't have the nuance and the expertise to create stimuli that really reflect what we think they reflect. And you can very easily see this if you compare your stimulus to any clip you find on YouTube of what's supposed to be comparable. Sometimes they're not realistic. We have to strive to make them as realistic as possible. And then finally, how is it framed within the study? So it's one thing to show people, say, a clip from a short film. It's another thing to frame why you're showing that to them, even if you're using deception to do that. How do you expose people to that stimulus in a way that makes them think, oh, okay, uh, I guess I get why they're asking me to do this, and then allows them to engage with the stimulus? That's gonna be a very study specific thing, but there are ways you can manage that by saying, we are gonna ask you to view one of a number of different scenes from a variety of different independent films in order to understand whether audiences are interested in seeing the entire film or something to that effect. It really depends on what your actual variables of interest are, your internal, uh, your internal measures, your actual variables of interest, your dependent variables, that's gonna shape how we do this. Now. Here's a shorthand way to do this, and then we'll get into the concrete examples, or as I refer to it, the fun stuff. Here's my guiding principle for stimulus design. Don't touch your tie. Look at me. Okay. I ask you a question. You have to think of the answer. Where do you look? No good. You look down, they know you're lying. And up, they know you don't know the truth. Don't use seven words when four will do. Don't shift your weight. Look always at your mark, but don't stare. Be specific, but not memorable. Be funny, but don't make him laugh. He's got to like you and then forget you the moment you've left his sight. Specific, but not memorable. Be funny, but don't make him laugh. He's got to like you and then forget you the moment you've left his sight. Great advice uh, from Brad Pitt's character, Rusty, to Matt Damon's character, Linus, in Ocean's Eleven as they get ready to, to defraud a casino owner. But the, de the degree of awkwardness that Matt Damon's character e exhibits is kind of how I feel about most research stimuli. That it's not quite what we want it to be and that we wish someone could come along and give us that Brad Pitt speech. So I show you that clip because it really, to me, is a lot of it. It's a con. You're trying to get people to buy that this content is coming to you completely naturally, even though it's been fabricated or manipulated in some fashion. So how do we do that? Well, we've got to make it specific but not memorable. Funny, but not to the point where they're over-noticing it. They've got to consume that stimulus in the way we hope they will, and then move along with the rest of the study so they participate and answer those items honestly. So. Now let's get into the fun stuff, some examples. Stimulus design is a fun challenge. I think maybe it requires a certain kind of makeup. It definitely requires some baseline skills, but I would argue any of you with the right time and attention to detail can get good enough at stimulus design to run your own competent experiments where you manipulate something in the media realm in an interesting way. Some of the examples I'm gonna show you today are very strong. Others have some pretty glaring weaknesses, and I show you that intentionally because just like when we talk about media design and media creation, I certainly couldn't show you my portfolio of all the things I've ever designed or all the films I've ever made or anything like that and say these are all perfect, that's ridiculous. Ask any creator and they will be able to identify all the flaws in their work, all of them. So let's go through this together and we'll be able to identify the strengths and the weaknesses as they emerge. I'm gonna discuss what I learned with each one too. Hopefully it'll inspire you to think a little bit more about how you design stimuli. So let's, let's start with some graphical examples. I'm not gonna go into these in detail, but a lot of times, one of the simplest ways to manipulate things for an experiment is to embed it in some kind of web page or Photoshop some mock-up. So in, in this case, we mocked an Ask Reddit discussion to create a more natural environment for people to respond to narratives about texting and driving. Because if we just paste them into the survey, a lot of times they feel very forced. But in the study example, we were saying, we want you to read an Ask Reddit page and reflect on what you think. And that kind of takes the focus off the texting and driving and puts the texting and driving within the context of something they might more naturally read. like in, comment section on reddit.com. Uh, years and years ago, I did this project with this undergraduate student who was interested in environmental change. Her name was Emily Hutter. You might know her as a recent PhD from the Department of Communication, now a postdoc at Northeastern. Uh, she was an undergrad and she was just interested in getting into some research work. Rory McGloin helped us with this too. 
we were just varying graphic designs for pitching certain messages related to adopting solar panels. These were all very collectivist helping all of us. And we were curious whether or not having a specific spokesperson or just a broad based idea would matter, or if maybe it came from a solar company, if that would change things. And so the idea is we're keeping as much similar as possible in each of the designs, but we do a little bit of Photoshop work to manipulate the message and make it more visual and hopefully a little more engaging. Those kinds of ideas are, are probably the more common stimuli that you design. They're also not particularly fun to dissect and pick apart, and they're not the kind of things people shy away from. I think most of us are comfortable at least putting a graphic up there, maybe modifying it a little bit. And if you're not, in an afternoon's worth of work, you could probably start to do that. I will talk about a different study that was a little more sensitive using Photoshop and manipulation a little bit later on. But for now, let's get into things a little bit more heavily. A great interview is oh, yeah. to impressing I a hiring about manager this. or recruiter. Every interview Sometimes is different, but there people are just ask me to voice things over for them. that can help you to be successful in any interview. That that was a piece from Brenda Rourke, uh, who recently got her PhD here as well and is at Northwest Missouri State. She asked me to give a presentation that they were going to use via avatar and asked me if I could just read the script in the most neutral voice possible. So I did. Those are the weird, fun things that people ask me to do. For the rest of today, let's talk about the more in-depth stuff that I get involved in. Okay, the interactive fitness study. This was Kimberly Embacher Martin's dissertation. Uh, and the work, the central question here, does exposure to objectifying imagery increase self-objectification and body surveillance, which then decreases flow and enjoyment? And if you saw the dissertation, it's more elaborate than this. I'm gonna kind of shorthand the research side of things and focus more on the stimulus today so that we're not here for two hours. But the design here, was a two by two where we were wondering if we objectified the presenter, the person teaching you how to use this interactive fitness bike and participate, if we made them highly objectified, exposed, if you will, where we were very aware of their body and how much a fantastic shape they were in and perhaps would that make us feel uncomfortable about ourselves. And the control was real, it was really just their voice and some imagery about how to use the bike, et cetera, and felt more like a traditional instruction manual put to video. Sex we varied as well, female or male. So Kim comes to me with this idea and says, I have this idea, I wanna work through it. It's just the instruction before they actually participate in some bike uh, activity, exercise, et cetera, in the lab. But one of the things that we want is to create this stimulus where folks are really uh, thinking a little bit about themselves, maybe getting self-conscious before they get in and start the study. So we did instructional fitness videos. We used a DSLR, Adobe Premiere, and some stock music. And we had a male and a female come in who Kim had selected, who she had access to, come in and model how to use these bikes and how to prepare for the workout. And a little snippet of the study design in a few different ways looked like this. Hello, and thank you for participating in our interactive fitness study. Before you begin, I'm going to show you some of the basic features of the interactive bike that you'll be riding for this study. I'm also going to show you two simple stretches to get you warmed up and ready to ride the bike. So let's get started. Here's the Expresso HD interactive bike. This bike has a 23 inch digital screen so that you can play games in virtual environments while you work out. Now Steve Lanza is the, uh, the male presenter and I've known Steve for years, and he's a graduate from our comm program. He's also a regular on our comm softball team in the summertime. Uh, Steve is very comfortable speaking to audiences. He is a very endearing fella, is very comfortable reaching out to people, connecting with people. He's done a lot of work professionally where he's used to engaging with clients, speaking to large rooms of people. He is not at all shy from this fitness study, and he enjoys being in front of the camera, and he had a really good time doing this work. So he read the lines and we tried to put it together in the most neutral instruction booklet kind of way possible. So you hear the kind of lame background stock music, the very still imagery showcasing the bike, et cetera. I like to think of this stimulus as the kind of thing you would see if you bought this bike and scanned a QR code about how to use it. Now let's take a look at the other condition. Hello and thank you for participating in our interactive fitness study. 
Before we begin, I'm going to show you some of the basic features of the interactive bike that you will be riding for this study. I am also going to show you a few simple stretches to get you warmed up and ready to ride the bike. So let's get started. Here is the Expresso HD interactive bike. This bike has a 23 inch digital screen so that you can play games in virtual environments while you work out. So Jen is an Instagram influencer and her background was mainly in still image, exercise, fitness, beauty, pictures, and so on and so forth. And Kim had access to Jen and said, I think you'd be great for this because the goal is to objectify or to make the person feel like they're in some scantily clad clothing and that they're like in perfect shape and they want you uh, as a participant to maybe think about what physical shape you're in as you participate in the study and what that does to the workout process and the enjoyment process, et cetera. Here's the problem. And we realized this the moment Jen got to set to start filming, is that Jen was not at all comfortable delivering lines that were scripted. Jen was not very comfortable in front of the camera. She was self-conscious, she was a little nervous, and she had a hard time articulating line by line in her delivery. Now, I don't say this to disparage Jen at all. There are plenty of folks out there who are just not naturally comfortable in front of a camera. And even myself, even doing this for all of you right now today, it's an acquired thing and uh, it takes time. And the first time you get in front of a camera, you're likely to stammer and stutter and feel uncomfortable. And that's kind of what happened with Jen. The other problem was we only had Jen for a few hours, so we had to get it filmed in this time. So we did, and we coached her line by line, but it was often very stilted. And I was thinking about the edit and how I could just capture a few pieces of voiceover and then cut to the bike or cut to the next angle and make it seem as fluent as fluid as possible. And unfortunately, to me, it still comes through. So let's take a look at the control condition, but we'll use Jen's voiceover for it to make a point. Hello, and thank you for participating in our interactive fitness study. Before we begin, I'm gonna show you some of the basic features of the interactive bike that you will be riding for this study. I am also gonna show you a few simple stretches to get you warmed up and ready to ride the bike. So let's get started. Okay, so we'll cut that off right there. Um, because I think you get the picture. The actual video goes on for about a minute and a half. Uh, but Jen's delivery in the voiceover condition doesn't sound, this goes right back to that accents problem I was talking about. It doesn't sound like the kind of person that a fitness company would hire to coach you through how to work out and how to get comfortable working out. Steve's much better in that regard, but Jen's isn't quite there. And so the issue that we get here is when you divide the experimental condition of seeing her go through the motions and then just the control condition of listening to her to go through the motions with some imagery, I don't think you get the central effect that we were looking for. So let's debrief this study a little bit. Um, a sample from the findings that trait self-objectification indirectly increased body surveillance. Body surveillance decreases the experience of flow state and flow state increased enjoyment. Yay. However, the manipulation didn't work. So there was no concrete condition across those two our concrete manipulation across those conditions that worked. There was no big difference there. So why? I would argue because in both conditions, in order for us to look at this model presenting to us and go, wow, she's in excellent shape. I'm not in that great a shape and start this process that we often see in media, the person we're looking at has to seem like they're natural and organic in that media setting. And in the case of Jen, she really wasn't. Even more so in the control condition where her voice doesn't have the authority of someone who would walk you through how to learn how to do certain exercises. So essentially we get tied up and we lose the thread of noticing the trainer because we're too busy noticing that the trainer's voice doesn't sound like someone who should be doing the video. And if you've ever watched a piece of media and went, who is this? You understand what I mean. So the stimulus notes, the female trainer failed that Ocean's Eleven test. Specific but not memorable, funny but don't make them laugh, etc. wasn't there. Second, the mic issue that we had that day was frustrating. We had a lavalier mic like the one I'm wearing right now, but it had a ton of interference with it. So we ended up having to cut it and use the on-camera mic, which is why it sounds very echoey and why it's not quite as professional as it could be. But that we could get past, especially with this kind of video. But what we can't get past is if the human communication happening through the media isn't there. So it's the same idea as making a bad short film where the actors don't really know how to act. It's going to be a very tough process for that audience. And that's probably not a great measure of anything about how audiences respond to film. Well, the same thing is true here, even in a fitness instructional video. If we don't look and sound confident, we're probably not going to get the degree of detail that we're looking for. Now let's change studies. 
Okay, this study is called the Sport Radio Study. Uh, this was with Dr. Michael Mudrick from the York College of Pennsylvania. Uh, he got his PhD in sport management here at UConn. Uh, Mike's a big sports fan. I'm a big sports fan, and he asked me if I'd be interested in participating in this, along with our colleague Sarah Stefano. And so we created this study that asked this question, does the accent of a sports radio host impact perceptions of their credibility, and thus attitudes towards the program, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the way we wanted to test this was a simple post-test only with control. We were gonna take a sportscaster or a sports radio host accent and shift it from northeast to southern to neutral and see if people responded differently to those accents. But the catch was that we were gonna talk about a New England topic, the New England Patriots prospects, particularly right after the New England Patriots had won their most recent Super Bowl. So the question was, they just won the Super Bowl, can we get a sports radio host to give an edgy take about how they're not gonna repeat, about how they were kind of fortunate and how next year might be bad for them and how the fans are getting ahead of themselves. If you listen to Boston sports media, you're very familiar with this kind of take because it's one of the ways they attract listenership. So the tools for this are simple, a USB mic, some garage band to manipulate the tracks and mix and match some of the bumper music, et cetera, some stock music for the bumper music, and then some Photoshop just to put a graphic on it so we could upload it to YouTube and embed it right in the study. Uh, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna listen across all three conditions. We're gonna hear the clip once, but I'm gonna vary the accent at like the one third and two third points. So here we go. Evenings with Mark Jerome. So we've been backed up on phones for a while. Let's go to Phil in Saugus. He's got a comment on the Patriots. Listen, I know people are getting worked up over Gronk and the free agents, but I'm looking at next year's opponents, and I feel pretty good about the past chances to repeat. I mean, other than the division, they've got the Chiefs, the Giants, the Seahawks, the Browns, the Battle Cowboys at no. home. And then the, the nope. I'm not doing schedule prediction radio, not with this team, not in the springtime. Listen. They play in a crap division that'll stay a crap division, and they're going to win that division. So, of course, they have a chance because they're going to the playoffs for the hundredth year in a row. Here's the thing, Phil. They weren't good last year. They caught some nice breaks. Moving to the Southern accent. They pissed away the bye. Houston blows a game to the Eagles down the stretch and gives it right back to them. Divisional round, Phillip Rivers and Anthony Lynn crap down their legs. They played a great first half versus Kansas City, and the wheels come off in the second part of that game. D4 bails them out being offsides on the game-clinching interception. Saints were the best team in the NFC all year. Terrible pass interference call. So bad they changed the rule. Gives the Rams the ball back when that game should have been over. You played the wrong team in the Super Bowl. You think they beat Drew Brees in a dome putting up 13 points? Rams offense didn't even show up. Gurley was hurt. Goff panicked. Brandon Cooks catch the ball. Okay, now to the neutral accent, the control condition. This team got lucky last year, and the competition has been subpar. They've been to three straight Super Bowls. Great, that says more about the league than it says about them. The year before, they should have lost to Blake Bortles. Blake Bortles. And now they've lost a bunch of pivotal guys, and it seems like they're sleepwalking through another offseason. Patrick Mahomes is going to be better. Deshaun Watson is going to be better. Hell, Baker Mayfield, Slam Darnold, Lamar Jackson, they're all going to be better. Can the Pats do it again? Sure. They need receivers, they need a pass rush, they need injury luck, and they're going to need some more breaks. It's just true. Quick update, no commercials. We'll be back on the other side. The way the actual stimulus was framed to participants was that we were testing out a radio show and asking them if they'd be interested in hearing more of it, maybe like a pilot for an actual sports radio station. The trick that we were trying to go with there was that the script for all three conditions was identical. So as you saw us easily sort of jump between conditions, you could pretty much jump between conditions the same way if I were to toggle through them. Uh, the clips each run within about two or three seconds of one another. We also made the decision, probably because I was scarred from the ice cream commercial, to have me deliver in each of these three accents. Now, I would never classify myself as a Southerner or someone comfortable doing a strong Southern accent in any form of media, maybe other than this setting. Uh, but I do have a little bit of experience going down to Kentucky because that's where my wife's family is from. And I do have a little bit of experience based on the research I did for this stimulus, actually listening to sports talk radio from various areas across the country, including Kentucky sports radio, uh, where I got a little bit of a feel for the cadence. And the detail there was that I wasn't trying to nail a perfect conversational Southern accent, which as we know is a, a range of accents anyway, if you look at different points across this country. 
I was trying to get what a Southern accent sounds like when it's converted to sports talk radio. And so I felt more optimistic about my ability to do that, especially because we could match the cadences, the emphasis, and the specific words being said in all three. So ideally, all conditions would have the similar amount of authority and conviction for the take. We could have went and found three different people, one to give a relatively what they call Northwest neutral news accent, one to give the real Northeast accent, and uh, maybe one to do a deep Southern accent. And we would have had very different sounding takes but we also would have had the nuance associated with bringing different voice actors into that setting and having them all trying to emulate one another because all it takes is drastically different cadence or emphasis on certain words or ideas, even if they're reading off the script, and now the pieces might sound very different. If you've ever done anything like theater, for example, you're familiar with how the delivery of the line has just as much emphasis as the line itself. So felt like it was a fairly strong uh, deviation between the three conditions. And in the debrief for this, what we found was that there was perceptions of Northeast accents that directly affected uh, whether or not the host was credible. It wasn't the conditions itself. We couldn't match up the conditions one, two, three, and see concrete differences um, across means, if you will. What we did see, though, was perceptions. If you thought the stimulus you heard, the host, Mark Jerome, that you heard, uh, and, and Jerome was a nickname I had in high school. It's a long story from theater. Uh, but if the host sounded like they were from the Northeast to you, you said they were more credible and more capable of talking about these topics. And it was a show as a Northeastern or New England sports fan, you'd be more interested in listening to host credibility than impacting attitude towards the host. And what we found here to me was that this one was really fun. This was a really fun project to do. Uh, we talked about this trade-off before of having one host deliver all the content or having multiple hosts with the very distinct accents deliver the content and try to make it sound sports radio-like. Uh, we went with the option we did, and the result, I think, is really interesting. I think I can explain the result still methodologically in that I think even my neutral accent as a Northeasterner talking about the New England Patriots is going to have a Northeast slant to it. I'm going to talk quickly. I'm going to make my emphasis really fast, even if I'm trying to deliver in more of a broadcast tone as opposed to more of a Northeast sports tone where they throw things around. Keep in mind also, if you're not familiar with the world of sports radio, it's pretty excessive. So the accents go over the top, the takes go over the top, the commentary is a little ridiculous. Uh, but I do think that if you bought it, if you said that guy's from the Northeast and he, he probably knows what he's talking about, that, that's what the study was all about. And I think that's valuable data for a programmer uh, to see if they're trying to put together a sports radio show. And it might explain why some of the loudest Boston accents you'll ever hear are located in Boston sports radio. Okay, so the review, uh, the stimuli can induce variance. And I think this is an important lesson, something I talk about methodologically with students and grad students sometimes, that sometimes the conditions in and of themselves aren't perfect and they don't work flawlessly where you can just walk away and go, ha, the experiment worked. But the stimuli can create gradations in your audience and how your audience reacts to the variables of interest. And so the act of sort of stirring up the pot with the different stimuli and inducing more variance can get to those perception of, for instance, perception of Northeast accent, uh, variables and get that to more clearly see how people approach the problem. Because at the end of the day, that independent variable is only there to induce that variance so we can better understand a process, okay? Uh, it doesn't work perfectly, but it sometimes works and it's useful and it's informative. Better perhaps than just asking them about their ideas about sports radio, for example. Okay, let's move on to a different study. The masking study. It's February of 2020. Myself, our graduate student, Christine Gilbert, are walking around campus and we make an observation that some students are starting to pop up wearing masks and that the masks seem out of place because no one else is wearing a mask. Of course, coronavirus is on the rise and we're familiar with that, but most people aren't, or at least they've only heard it as a passing phrase. It's February of 2020. So we said, mm, let's run a study and take a look at whether or not we notice things about face masks. So, do people respond differently to news stories about this new virus that might be a pandemic someday, COVID-19, or the flu, as our other author, Dr. Sarah Stefano, suggested as a bit of a control or a comparison that feature people either wearing masks or not wearing masks? And then the secondary question that we also asked, because so much of the news about COVID was coming from China, was does ethnicity matter in the equation? 
So let's start with the imagery, okay? Here's the design. It's masking by race, by virus, okay? So the first piece of it is, are they masked or unmasked in the photos that you see? The second part is, are they Asian or white? And the third part is, is the disease being discussed, COVID-19, this new thing, the coronavirus, or the flu? And what we did was we took a Reuters story that we found, a real existing Reuters story about coronavirus being on the rise and raising some concerns across the world, not just in China. And we modified it a bit to focus more on our target audience, which we'll talk about in a minute. Photoshop and Reuters were the tools. We also used some stock imagery that we had access to to make some manipulations. So these are young Chinese students. Actually, this isn't technically stock imagery. This is a photo from when President Obama visited China during his term, okay? And so we took this photograph of these, of these Asian students who are listening, presumably, uh, and we modified it, we Photoshopped it, we put masks on them. And I think when you kind of go back and forth, you start to notice that it's definitely Photoshopped, but if you were only exposed to one or the other, especially before everybody was wearing a mask, you probably don't notice. Now, for the white students, we wanted to do the exact same thing, but we needed a similar photo. So you'll notice the orientations between the photos are kind of similar, okay? You've got a student in the foreground, and then a student behind them, and then some other people that are kind of completely out of focus, and they're not wearing masks in the background, but the two people in the front, based on our Photoshop adjustment, are. We have the same idea here. There's a female in the foreground, there's a male a little behind her, and then two other students in the background, and we Photoshop masks onto them as well. Okay, that was kind of fun, kind of a weird thing to do. Uh, at the time, I had no idea we'd be dealing with masks for the foreseeable future. We just thought this was a strange nuance of people reacting to this story about a new virus. And then we embedded it into a Reuters story, okay? Uh, and we modified the story. So the story was in U.S. colleges, coronavirus concerns rise. And we took data, actual information that was relevant at the time we were gathering the data and incorporated it into the story. We used as much of the Reuters article as we could. And then we modified it a bit to make it more sensitive to who we knew was our participant audience, which were college students here at the University of Connecticut. So we talked a little bit about how New York University, because we figured that was nearby enough to get people's attention, was adapting. And we put in some false quotations from New York University students. And as you can see, in one condition, the picture is front and center with students who are unmasked and in the other, they are masked. Okay. We did the same thing with the flu article talking about how flu outbreak was rising and that there were concerns about it. And we took an article about the flu that year and what you could do to mitigate it, et cetera, and worked that all into the copy. We changed all the details and again, put a photo front and center. Um, and of course there's really eight conditions, not just four, but I'm just going to show you the two and two, uh, masked or unmasked. And so what we wanted to do was make those comparisons. But before we went forth and just said, that's the study, we realized that in COM1000 in the participant pool, a number of our participants participate, no matter how many times we tell them to, on their mobile phones. They're always on their mobile phones participating, which means that we needed a, a stimulus that didn't just look like this on a mobile phone because you'd have to pinch and zoom and, and, and look carefully and zoom out. And honestly, we didn't think most would invest that time. We needed a story that would load fully on a mobile phone in a mobile phone format. So I sighed and went back to Photoshop. And we took the same stories and we adjusted based on the way the Reuters website looks when you're looking at it on a mobile device. So started with a screenshot of the Reuters website and then we added in the photos and used the captions accordingly and put the entire news article beneath it so that it looked natural to them. Uh, we did the same thing, of course, with the flu. And then, of course, we alternated the pictures across the eight conditions as well. So this step was simple but important. And I think that's the kind of detail and attention that you need to make sure you have with stimulus design. If there's going to be people looking at mobile stimuli, the mobile stimuli should be optimized for mobile. Otherwise, your study is probably going to annoy them before you get a true effect of how they respond. Now, the warning here with the debrief on this study is that we only scratch the surface of this data. Uh, Christine started uh, by looking just at the conditions of the white students with information about COVID. And that's all we've done so far because I don't know about you, but I got kind of busy in 2020 and kind of still digging out these days, right? Uh, so we started with the white COVID conditions and what we saw was that for participants who saw the students wearing masks, they had increased risk perceptions about COVID-19 compared to no masks. So the masks did get their attention. There's obviously a ton more analysis to do with this data, and we're all really optimistic that we'll have the time, hopefully soon, which is what we all academics say, right, to dig in and part this out because it is really interesting. 
Now, some notes about the stimulus. We had no idea what we were getting into. There is a balance between content accuracy and the goal of the research. And you're gonna say, what do you mean content accuracy? Well, Reuters does not put big photos front and center on their website like that. Uh, generally speaking, Reuters photos tend to be a lot smaller. But our goal was to find a natural way to get people to understand that COVID-19 is a thing or the flu is an ongoing thing and that it's concerning and then compare what they thought when they saw college students who were wearing masks versus not to see if the masks maybe heightened awareness or heightened fears, et cetera. So uh, in this case, we made a trade-off and sometimes you have to do that. You have to make sure that stimulus is front and center and, and the thing that you really wanna test is accessible easily to your participants. And I think that was a trade-off that was worth doing. And so that's one of the battles you have as a stimulus designer. At what points do we deviate from how it should look to make it look in a way that is more noticeable, but still fits in. And then don't forget your mobile users too. So the review, uh, there's a ton to do with that project. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what the rest of the data reveals. Okay, so one more example study for you. And I think it's probably the biggest stimulus design I've ever engaged in, and it's the most important. And call this the police communication study. So about three years ago, I was approached by a team of researchers here at the University of Connecticut who were interested in understanding how the police statements after these shootings that often happen, unfortunately happen way too often, uh, the police response to it, and also of course the race and the sex of the victim involved, uh, affects how people respond in general. So if there's a traffic stop shooting, which we've seen far too many of, how do the participants respond to the news story of that shooting when we vary whether the police talk about protecting police officers or talk about protecting the victims or the community? And then how do they respond if the victim's sex is different or the victim's race is different? So this was a heavy topic, but what's really interesting here is that this is a two by two by two, okay? So we're varying race, black or white, we're varying sex, male or female, and then we're varying the statement to either support the victim or to support the officer involved in the shooting. The biggest challenge here was that when I was approached with this study, they said, we, we need a dash cam video of the shooting itself. We can't just use another shooting for obvious reasons. Uh, we need original content that emulates what we've unfortunately seen in dash cam shootings. So, it's a stimulus within a stimulus, and it's about an incredibly sensitive topic. A news story featuring a shooting, showing the dash cam footage, and then talking about how the police department has responded. The tools were plentiful, okay? We had DSLR for the main news piece, iPhone uh, for some of the dash cam footage, Photoshop, Premiere, plenty of stock images, stock footage, stock music, you name it. The idea was to throw the kitchen sink at it. Uh, You've got eight different conditions. They need to be eight different news stories. We discussed making it a local news story and because it would be a little more anonymous where the news outlet was or the location of the story was. And uh, this is one of those moments, one of the few moments I've had in stimulus design where it wasn't just about getting the study right, it was about doing justice to such a sensitive topic. And I think every now and then you tackle something really heavy in your work and when you do, you realize you have to take a step back and get it right on multiple levels, not just because you care about your work, but also because you care about how other people might consume your work and about the issue at hand. So these are the stock photos the researchers came up with. And to you and me, these are stock photos on the surface. And when I first got them in an email attachment, I opened them and said, okay, we can work with these. And uh, fortunately they're comparable. The female photos and the male photos are kind of angled similarly. Well done, good work on the part of the researchers. And unfortunately, sort of very quickly, I stopped seeing these photos and I still don't see these photos as just stock images anymore. I, I see them as a part of this context of the story that started to feel a little bit real to me. So uh, discretion advised, uh, sensitive topic coming, but here's the news story we put together. Last night, police response to a call involving a potential car theft turned deadly. Michael Thomas was shot and killed during a motor vehicle stop by officers late yesterday evening, and now police are conducting an investigation into the matter. It was just after 9 p.m. last night when police received a call reporting a stolen car. Suspect is a black male in a gray sedan last seen driving north on Park Street. Copy, we're on our way. Several minutes after receiving the call, 
Officers spotted a man matching the description of the suspect. Dispatch, we're engaging in a stop now. We may need backup. Exactly what happened next remains a mystery, but dash cam footage recorded from the officer's car at the time may shed some light on the incident. Viewer discretion is advised. An investigation is currently underway. Officials have not yet released the names of the officers involved and have given few details concerning the cause of last night's events, although it has been confirmed that Michael Thomas was unarmed. The chief of police released a statement early this morning, stating, During this difficult time, we offer our support to the officers who responded to last night's call as the investigation thus far has shown no evidence that protocol was broken. As this investigation moves forward, our department must reflect on how to best protect our communities and ensure the safety of our responding officers, who continue to risk their lives to protect and serve our community. A candlelight vigil has been scheduled tonight in memory of Michael Thomas. The officers in question have been suspended pending further investigation. Now, before we go into any commentary, I do want to show you the piece of the alternate condition where the police statement is different. So for this one, we'll use a female victim. So it's Michelle Thomas instead of Michael. We won't show you the rest of it again, just the statement part. The chief of police released a statement early this morning, stating, During this difficult time, we offer support to Michelle Thomas's family and loved ones. As this investigation moves forward, our department must reflect on how to best protect our communities and ensure that community member safety is our priority during every police stop. The circumstances of Michelle Thomas's death are unacceptable, and we must make changes to ensure that these tragedies come to an end. So as you can see from the finished piece, I think we did a pretty good job with it, but it's also still very heavy, and it's really hard to put something like that together because at first it's this project where it's really serious and sensitive then you get into the weeds on the little details like where the graphics go and whatnot and then it becomes a little fun and then you put it together and it comes together and it starts to feel real and once it feels real it kind of takes on a life of its own uh, I want to talk first about the design for the news story you'll notice we did not use an anchor at a desk that was originally in the plan and the argument that I made was to use an anchor at a desk would mean getting multiple takes uh, for the just the lead into the story and also that anchor couldn't be me if there was any chance they were ever gonna use a Yukon sample because I teach a large lecture course here. Uh, that said, I could easily do it if it was all voiceover. So that's why the piece starts, instead of with that quick 20 seconds from an anchor, it starts with a voiceover from the same reporter, which is me on a microphone. So it's voiceover throughout, but it helps with the consistency and it allows me to mix and match the same takes with the exception of the central things that are being manipulated. Uh, tried to focus on consistency and professionalism. So the graphic packages, for example, were all laid out in Photoshop and then dumped over the top of all the video clips in Premiere. Used a lot of uh, stock footage of like fancy news backgrounds for showing photos and statements like that kind of strobing red you see in the background there. Uh, and we tried to pay attention to detail. So for instance, the time shifts after every 60 seconds in the lower right hand corner. Uh, I, the temperature is there and it's a realistic temperature for early January, et cetera. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the dash cam footage. I won't show it to you again. Um, the dash cam footage was taken with an iPhone. I drive an SUV. My wife drives a smaller sedan, which made it easy. We worked that into the news story as well. I went out on the street in front of the house we were living in at the time. I placed my iPhone on the dashboard facing outward. It was a wet, rainy, dark, dingy winter night. Uh, which made it really convenient for what I was trying to capture uh, because it allowed us to murk this up a little bit. We didn't want it to be concrete and crystal clear. We want it to be a little fuzzy to add some confusion, if you will, to what you're actually seeing. Um, but it's kind of clear and you can use your imagination to fill in the blanks of what, what it is that's actually happening. I don't have a weapon of any kind on me. I'm not holding anything. Uh, I'm just walking in a dark black coat and black pants. I get out of the car. I walk over to the other car. There is no one in the other car, just a turn signal on. Uh, and what I'm doing uh, in that scene is I just kind of 
pantomime a yell without actually making a sound and then jerked backwards a couple of times. And I used myself because I didn't want to incorporate anybody else in this because it's a very strange behavior. And sometimes as production folks, we try extra hard to minimize the amount of people involved anytime we're doing something that might seem out of the ordinary to the public eye. Uh, and so I did all that. All the sound you hear, the police radios, the details, etc., are all added in later. The scream, if you will, was just me screaming into my iPhone later using a thrown voice that we then modulate. Uh, Sarah actually helped me with the police ditch passer voice, which we then changed and we modulated so that it was a different octave so that you couldn't hear it as Sarah. You just heard it as a random voice. Uh, same with the police officers, etc. The details there were all really critical. The one thing I want to address in this footage is that there is muzzle fire. And I did not have that in the original stimulus. It was asked for to make it clear that the police officer had shot. And I argued, because unfortunately to get this right, and the most disturbing thing I've ever had to do with stimulus design, I had to watch about 10 of these horrific dash cam videos. The fact that there are 10 and much more is haunting, but I had to watch about 10 of them to get a feel for the latitude of what we could do that would still seem like it was appropriate to the context of the videos people often see. And there's not muzzle fire in this kind of footage almost ever, virtually ever, uh, but they wanted it to be clear. And this was a push and pull case where I said, okay, if that's what you want, that's fine. Personally, I would not have added it. I think the video didn't need it, okay? Now, one more detail here. I actually got asked about two years later, the lead researcher had left the University of Connecticut and moved to an institute in Canada. Could we take the stimulus and change it so that it reflected a CBC news piece? And so I had to dust this thing off a couple years later and change the entire graphics package. But the advantage of doing these things piece by piece is that you can make these kind of changes. Here's a brief snippet of what that looked like. Last night, police response to a call involving a potential robbery turned deadly. Michael Thomas, an indigenous man, was shot and killed during a motor vehicle stop by officers late yesterday evening. And now the SIU is conducting an investigation into the matter. So we'll stop it there. Uh, you'll notice that the manipulation also changed because of the issues related to indigenous people in Canada, and that was a new focal point for the research. You'll notice the graphic package changes entirely. You'll notice that no longer is it the police, it's the SIU. You'll notice that the temperature is no longer 36 degrees Fahrenheit, it is now 10 degrees Celsius. There are details that have to be worked out and gotten right based on the audience and the response. We had a number of back and forth emails about the specific questions because I didn't know much about how things run in Canada. I had to Google some things myself too to make sure we were representing it accurately, explaining it accurately. I also had to watch a bunch of news clips of CBC to see what their news looks like to make sure the graphic package was believable and accurate. These are the details, but the details are changeable. So if you design your own stimuli, the upshot of this is there's replication studies and variation studies to be had. So the debrief on this study is pretty simple. Uh, I don't know the answers to the research. The researchers are still doing their work. This is a case where I was more contracted as an outsider to do the stimulus design. I'll be curious to see how it goes and I've asked them to keep me posted. Second, uh, the stimulus notes, this was multi-layered. It was very sensitive and there were a lot of details that had to be right. This required a lot of time. This is not beginner level work, but it's the kinds of things that can be done to enact really interesting, important research if you've got stimulus designers on board or if you wanna to learn to dabble a little bit yourself and start to work on the skills necessary to do these sorts of things. The review, I think excellent experiments are really possible if everybody collaborates. And we'll talk a bit about that for collaboration because those are the end of my example. So now just a couple quick takeaways for this talk and I'm gracious for you for hanging on with me because it takes a little while to explain some of these things. First, you can't overlook the stimulus. I hope I made that point clear about all the little things we've been thinking about through these studies over time. Second. Involve your media designers in the study design. The more we can go back and forth about the details and the specifics and why you want something the way you want it and how it's working, the better the final product will be. This isn't a case like with someone working in your lab where you might not want them to know the hypotheses so they don't tip off participants. This is a case where you want your designers to know exactly what you're trying to do because they can make it as professional as possible while also making sure it respects the manipulations you have in mind. Third, you gotta take the extra time to get it right with these things because when you don't, the respondents notice and that gets lost in your data. And that's the damaging thing. And finally, I wanna say in the Department of Communication, this is an area that I really hope we can expand. We've built a lot of our multimedia production courses. We've done a lot of work. We've had a lot of interested graduate students recently in production and tech. 
And I think that we've got space to make this part of our brand, if you will, as a department, that we have enough mix of exceptional methodology and fantastic researchers and talented media designers and students that we can start to create more ambitious, more interesting experiments like the ones we just looked at and specifically that last one. I think there's a lot of opportunity there and I think it's a great area. So don't forget the stimulus and if you need help with yours, you're free to talk to me. I wanna say thank you for your time and I'm gonna encourage everybody to go ahead and jump on the WebEx link we're providing so that you can participate in the post chat for as long as you like. I'll be happy to hang out till two if that's what it takes. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful day if you're not joining us. Thank you for your time.